Hello everyone, I'm Zach. Now this may surprise you, but a lot of really smart people have some really silly ideas. What is the nature of reality? How does the universe behave? And why does it exist? Traditionally, these are questions for philosophy, but philosophy is dead. That the whole community of philosophers that previously had added materially to the thinking of the physical scientists were rendered essentially obsolete. You made a wrong turn a while back because you ended up in one of my strange corners. Keep watching to see why science absolutely cannot function without philosophy. Of all the things in modern life, science has probably had the most impact on modern society. The technological breakthroughs made in just the past century would have completely confounded humanity just a century prior. Because of science, I'm able to record and edit this video, and post it on a digital infrastructure called the internet, for all of you wonderful, beautiful, amazing viewers out there. But what is science? How does science work? How do scientists do science? How do they generate scientific theories? How do we test these theories? What do these theories tell us about the world, if anything? Is science influenced by social and political factors? This is just an itty bit of the questions that we're going to be asking in this video. One thing to help distinguish science from philosophy of science is that most philosophers of science love science, but most scientists hate philosophers of science. Though, hashtag not all scientists. Physicist Richard Feynman once said, Philosophy of science is about as useful to scientists as ornithology is to birds. Of course, if birds could understand ornithology, it's hard to deny that it might be useful to them. Let's start with the simplest question. What is science? We might say science is a structure built on facts. That seems pretty intuitive, but many scientists would disagree, saying we shouldn't just become archivists of facts, but go beyond in such a way as to learn the laws that govern facts. Or we should be trying to understand new ways of understanding facts. If we have doubt over this, then we have to agree with geologist and zoologist Stephen Jay Gould that, quote, in science, fact can only mean confirmed to such a degree that it would be perverse to withhold provisional assent. As you can see, our initial statement isn't as certain as we initially thought it to be. In this video, we're going to be asking questions and problematizing the way that we view observation, justification, heuristics or the study of methods and models, and the alleged independence of science from social and cultural influences. The starting point for philosophy of science naturally seems to be observation. Science is a method of inquiry that requires empirical observation after all. So how do we go about observing things? Well, the obvious answer is to use your eyeballs and your earballs. The eye is often described like a camera. The images we see are imprinted on our retinas and sent to our brain parts. This might bring us to the conclusion that if someone else looks at the same object in the exact same way we do, that they'll make the same observation. However, such a belief is dubious at best. Look at the famous duck-rabbit picture. Is it a duck or is it a rabbit? The fact we can't be certain leads us to problems ranging from the merely theoretical to the geopolitical. There can be no peace until they renounce their rabbit god and accept our duck god. Attack! We can also look at this. This is called a Necker cube. It is not clear whether the lines are in the front or in the back, so different observers might get different results. Even our cultural context could affect what we see. The Necker cube is a creation of perspective in Western art. People from another culture might not even see a cube, just a whole bunch of straight lines. This shows that there's more to seeing than just the eyeball. As philosopher of science Stephen French says, Quote, what you see isn't just determined by the light falling on your retina. It is determined by a host of other factors, by your frame of mind, by your prior beliefs, by my suggestions. There's a well-known story of Galileo Galilei trying to convince his colleagues that he had found objects that are revolving around Jupiter, satellites that would later be known as the Galilean moons of Jupiter, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. 
Mind you, his colleagues had never seen a telescope before, it being a relatively new invention. And Galileo had built this one himself. His colleagues were skeptical that the objects being shown through the telescope were not some artifact or defect of the equipment. Furthermore, Galileo couldn't even really describe the physics of how the telescope worked. He only knew that it magnified things. Galileo made the Jupiter observations in 1611, but the theory of optics which explained the physics of how the telescope worked wouldn't be invented till the 1630s by philosopher René Descartes, and wouldn't be fully fleshed out until the 1670s by Isaac Newton. Well, certainly Galileo could have just pointed the telescope at a mountain on the Earth and showed that it magnified it. But this too remained unconvincing to his colleagues. Quote, the problem is that observation statements typically presuppose theory, and so they are only as secure as the theory they presuppose. Galileo's observations were at odds with Aristotelian astronomy, which had dominated Western thought for almost two millennia at this point. We'll talk in greater detail later about Aristotelian astronomy. But one of its beliefs are that the laws that govern the heavens are fundamentally different than the laws that govern the earth. Galileo's colleagues had no reason to believe that just because the telescope magnified the mountain on the earth that it would do the same thing in the heavens. The observations Galileo was making simply didn't have the theoretical background to be deemed as legitimate. Next we're going to talk about justification. How secure are our observations? How are our observations justified as legitimate? This is the problem of justification. This is also known as the problem of demarcation. How do we demarcate between scientific statements and pseudoscientific statements? We already did a whole video on this topic, so we won't spend too much time here in this video. We'll just go over the basics. On one side, you have the verificationists. Verificationists believe that in order for a statement to be meaningful, you must be able to verify it. My hypothesis is clearly true if I can go out and find an example of it somewhere. If we look at the central tenet of verificationism, a statement is meaningful if it can be verified, we must ask, is this statement meaningful and can it be verified? What possible criterion could we use to determine that the statement is in fact meaningful? One criticism is that it seems like the central tenet of verificationism is meaningless. Opposed to verificationism is falsificationism. Falsification requires us to only accept confirmations tentatively, and we must actively try to find falsifying evidence, and if we do, we must be willing to cast off our hypotheses into the dustbins of history like a prom night bebe. For falsificationism, the inability to refute a hypothesis is not a virtue, but a vice. The ability to refute a statement is what demarcates a scientific statement from a pseudoscientific statement. Yet, it might not always be clear exactly what is being falsified when contradicting evidence presents itself. Is it merely the hypothesis itself, or does it include the numerous different theories that underpin any hypothesis? Let's look at the problem of dark matter in astronomy. A long time ago in a far off land. There was a scientist studying the way galaxies rotate. She assumed that just like our solar system, where the planets furthest from the sun orbit slower than those closer, that the stars at the edge of the galaxy would move slower than those at the galactic core. This is supported by both Newtonian gravity and general relativity. However, the scientist was shocked to find that not only were the stars at the edges not moving slower, but they were moving as fast as the galactic core. Now this in and of itself isn't contradictory. If the outer sections of the galaxy have sufficient mass, then we would expect them to move at this speed. Yet based on the visible matter in the galaxy, there was nowhere near enough mass to account for this. Not even if you include black holes and neutron stars and all those other weird supermassive objects out there. You literally don't even come close. At these speeds, there shouldn't be enough gravity to hold the outer stars in. They would be flying out, up, down, left, right, in all directions. There's a couple of answers as to why this problem is occurring. Either there is some dark particle that doesn't interact with light, or really anything, except weakly through gravity, which means our standard model of particle physics is wrong, or at the least very incomplete, or the laws of gravity work differently at the galactic scale than they do at the planetary scale. 
If it is the latter, that means general relativity is simply wrong. If we take a falsificationist attitude, we may very well have to throw out general relativity itself. The problem is that general relativity does accurately predict a number of other phenomena which have not been falsified. Phenomena like gravitational lensing, gravitational waves, the red shifting of light by gravity, etc. Of course, general relativity works just fine if you infer there must be some type of dark matter which exists. However, such an inference requires that you add so much dark matter that 90% of all matter in the universe is matter we can't see or interact with. Can it really be the case that less than 10% of all mass in the universe is visible? So how do we figure this quandary out? With more experiments, baby! The reason we infer dark matter exists is not just because galaxies are spinning way too fast. Gravity bends light around it in a phenomena called gravitational lensing. When we look at the galaxy, we see this occurring all over, even though the visible matter doesn't have enough mass. The observation of the bullet cluster sealed the deal that general relativity isn't wrong with regards to dark matter. The bullet cluster is two clusters of galaxies that smashed into each other. Because of the astronomical distances involved in interstellar space, Space, the stars in the galaxy move right past each other. But the gas, which makes up the majority of the visible mass in a galaxy, doesn't. As you can see in this picture, the gas has been pulled out of the cluster and is currently in the center. If general relativity is wrong, then we would expect to still see the majority of mass in the center with the gas. But when we use our good old friend gravitational lensing, we see it with the stars, which matches our predictions of what dark matter is like. General relativity is saved. So does this mean we have to throw out the standard model of particle physics? Again, there are a number of other predictions that come with particle physics which have been tested and not falsified. It's probably best to just assume our understanding of quantum mechanics is severely incomplete, which makes a lot of sense considering how bizarre quantum mechanics is. One last thing about falsification. Just because your test doesn't work doesn't necessarily mean your hypothesis is falsified. It could be that you performed the test incorrectly, or there was some type of defect in the instruments that you used. That's enough about justification. Next we'll talk about heuristics. Heuristics comes from the Greek word heuriskos, meaning I find. Heuristics is ultimately the study of methods, models, and approaches used for discovery and problem solving. Heuristics is important because it helps us realize our cognitive biases, and shows much of the context behind our observations. In our everyday lives, we typically use an everyday heuristic or common sense. This would be called a non-standard heuristic because it doesn't rely on the laws of probability. There's also a representativeness heuristic. This is where the conclusions are based on the expectation that a small sample size will be representative of the parent population. This suffers from a number of problems. If your sample size is too small, you can't reliably generalize to the larger population. Also, if your sample size doesn't represent the diversity of the larger population, then again, your results are going to be at best skewed and at worst useless. Another common heuristics is Occam's razor, which states that entities should not be multiplied beyond necessity. Just as a note, it isn't actually clear that William of Occam ever actually said that, but that's besides the point. In the scientific context, Occam's razor simply states that the simplest answer is usually the right one. So if you have multiple different theories with comparable explanatory power, you should use the one which is most simplified, discarding those assumptions which do not actually improve the explanations. Again, this seems to be intuitively a good idea. Yet. How exactly does one find the measure of simplicity? Despite multiple measures being used, it's generally agreed that there's no meta-simplicity that can be used for all theories. In other words, there appears to be as many different measures of simplicity as there are theories out there. And the task of choosing between measures of simplicity is as difficult as choosing between different theories. Heuristics also tries to find internal inconsistencies in theories. For instance, physicist Niels Bohr famously created one of the earliest models of what an atom should look like. We've all probably seen this model. If we take the simplest atom, hydrogen, we see one proton in the nucleus and an electron orbiting it. Bohr based his model on assumptions made from classical physics. 
Bohr said that when electrons gain energy, they move to a higher orbital, and if they gain enough energy, they can escape the atom by moving beyond the potential orbitals an atom has. Now, this model has several problems. We'll look at the internal inconsistency first, though. Say subatomic particles did behave in the way classical physics describes objects. Classical physics says objects that accelerate radiate energy. If this were true for electrons, they would radiate energy until their orbits decayed, crashing them into the nucleus, meaning no atoms, no Niels Bohr, no you, and no me. So Bohr's model is inconsistent with classical physics because he refused to believe electrons radiated energy. The other problem is that subatomic particles don't follow the rules of classical mm -hmm. physics. They behave according to quantum mechanics. The idea that an electron would orbit the nucleus is nonsense because subatomic particles have no fixed position, something necessary for anything to orbit anything else. Electrons exist as probability fields. This picture shows it well. The brighter areas are where the greatest probability of an electron exists. The more energy an electron has, the greater the range of the probability field is till it extends outside of the atom altogether. When we ask how science works, we may be led to believe that new theories are constructed on the backs of old theories. But many philosophers of science reject the progressive view of science. Philosopher Thomas Kuhn describes scientific models as relying on certain paradigms or disciplinary matrices. A paradigm sets the rules, determines the central problem of the scientific field, delineates the accepted methodology, and the criteria or justification of discovering the solution to a problem. New scientists are in indoctrinated into the paradigm to believe this is normal science. A paradigm is the normative standards which determine scientific inquiry. Kuhn said that paradigms are often challenged by scientific revolutions that completely upend the existing paradigm and replace it with a new one. Let's return to Aristotelian astronomy versus Galilean astronomy. Aristotelian astronomy was geocentric, positing that the Earth was at the center of the cosmos and all other objects revolved around it in perfect circles. The objects in the heavens were perfect spheres and followed different laws than those on Earth. So when Galileo showed his colleagues these objects revolving around Jupiter, this flew in the face of Aristotelian astronomy, which stated everything must revolve around the Earth. A similar challenge is made by asserting a heliocentric model of the universe where the Earth and other heavenly bodies revolve around the Sun. When Galileo looked through his telescope, contrary to heavenly objects being perfectly spherical, he observed objects that were neither perfect nor always spherical. The Earth itself is more pear-shaped than spherical. Furthermore, when orbits of planets were carefully examined, they were found to be elliptical, not perfect circles. Despite his colleague's stubbornness, Galileo continued to collect data over a long period of time. Other astronomers also using telescopes began to see the same observations that Galileo was eventually got to the point where there was so much evidence contradicting the Aristotelian astronomy model that a paradigm revolution occurred. The Aristotelian model simply didn't have explanatory power. Down with Aristotle. Long live Galileo. Finally, the last question we want to bring up, is science independent from its social context? Short answer, no. We did a similar video about this where we asked the question, is math racist, that you should definitely check out. Social factors definitely determine what science investigates. For instance, during the Cold War, a great deal of money and political willpower was pushed towards studying rocket science. This wasn't done because the politicians wanted to escape the surly bonds of Earth and see all the cool space shit that was out. This was done to create rockets that could carry nuclear bombs from anywhere in the world to the USSR, where they would promptly explode. Boom. Now, thankfully that never happened, but we did get all this cool understanding of the solar system from sending stuff up there and having a look around. We can also look at how social factors determine how science investigate. Experiments on humans are often constrained by a wide variety of ethical concerns. Unfortunately, not all cultures place the same value on humans that we do. Nazi scientists performed horrible experiments on people to try and understand the limits of the human body. Most scientists agree that these experiments are abominable, but there is debate on whether the discoveries made should still be utilized. Some say as awful as the experiments were, they could still provide useful data. Others say we shouldn't even look at it because of the inhumanity of the experiments. Of course, 
there's also the question of whether the data is even useful to begin with. Many scientists believe that the experiments were so flawed heuristically that the data is useless and can't really explain anything. Gender bias is another thing that affects how science works. Gender bias has led to the discrepancy we see of women in the hard sciences. Gender bias also contributes to what is being investigated. Female birth control pills pills that temporarily sterilize a person, have been around since the 1960s. Yet such a pill for men has remained elusive and not considered very important. This bias puts the onus on women to prevent pregnancy as opposed to men. Gender bias also determines how science investigates certain problems. Strokes and cardiovascular disease often affect men and women in different ways which bear on a patient's responsiveness to treatment. This can affect survivability, recovery, and subsequent quality of life. Yet most studies of strokes rely on samples that include only male animals. When male is considered the norm, extrapolations are made to women which could have very serious consequences. The same thing happened with the study of cardiovascular disease. As of 1993, 80% of all trials only included men. Not just that, but the men used in those trials were often middle-aged. Though it is known that women generally experience cardiovascular disease at older ages than men. As we can see, science is far from independent of social factors, and is often deeply political. With everything that we've gone over, I think it is clear that science is underpinned by a whole array of philosophical presuppositions that are not as easy to answer as one might think. Now you may say that most scientists already deal with these problems while they're sciencing. So why do we even need philosophers of science? Well, whether we actually need philosophers of science is a whole different can of worms. When scientists are dealing with these problems, the discourse and thought process that they use is no longer purely scientific. They are engaging in philosophy of science while they're sciencing. We'll end this video by listing off a number of other questions that philosophy of science answers. If you're into chemistry, some of the interests philosophers have are the relationship between chemical concepts and reality. Resonance structures are often used in chemical explanations despite their decided non-reality. In a similar sense, the reality of concepts such as nucleophiles and electrophiles has been questioned. Questions regarding whether chemistry studies atoms, substances, or reactions, i.e. processes. Symmetry in chemistry. Specific specifically the origin of homochirality in biological molecules. Reductionism with respect to physics and questions regarding whether quantum mechanics can fully explain all chemical phenomena. If you're into psychology, many interests include what is the appropriate methodology for psychology? Mentalism, behaviorism, or compromise? Are self-reports a reliable data gathering method? What conclusions can be drawn from null hypotheses tests? Can first-person experiences, emotions, desires, beliefs, etc. be measured objectively? What is a cognitive module? Are humans rational creatures? What psychological phenomena comes up to the standard required for calling it knowledge? What is innateness? Maybe you're one of those people into math. Well, philosophy has a discipline for you. Questions include, what are the sources of mathematical subject matter? What is the ontological status of mathematical entities? What does it mean to refer to a mathematical object? What is the character of a mathematical proposition? What is the relation between logic and mathematics? What is the role of hermeneutics in mathematics? What kinds of inquiry play a role in mathematics? What are the objectives of mathematical inquiry? What gives mathematics its hold on experience? What are the human traits behind mathematics? What is mathematical beauty? What is the source and nature of mathematical truth? What is the relationship between the abstract world of mathematics and the material universe? What is a number? Are mathematical proofs exercises in tautology? Why does it make sense to ask whether 1 plus 1 equals 2 is true? How do we know whether a mathematical proof is correct? Thank you for watching this video. Please support the channel on Patreon for as little as two dollars, two eeny bitty dollars. You can get benefits including first look at all new videos. I'll see you the next time you make a wrong turn. Bye.